Welcome to Season 3 of Students of Mind, the podcast that's all about opening up and normalizing discussions about mental health in ways that anyone can comprehend. In the first two seasons, we sat down with mental health experts and survivors to give you a full circle picture of each topic. In this new season, we will continue to explore the world of mental health through the insights of experts, healers, and individuals with lived experience. From alternative healing modalities to living with multiple illnesses, this season we will cover a wide range of topics with the help of a diverse selection of guests. My name is Jade, and for today's episode, we have the first of a few discussions on psychedelic-assisted therapy. For this first discussion, I sit down with Aubrey Howard for an in-depth background on psychedelics. I hope by listening to the show, you're able to learn something new and gain some encouragement through hearing our experts and listening to the journeys of our guests. However, this show is not a substitute for professional advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your mental health professional or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have about your condition. Never disregard professional advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on the Students of Mind podcast. Today's guest is Aubrey Howard. Aubrey is a somatic breathwork and psychedelic assisted psychotherapy facilitator based in Philadelphia. Aubrey is the owner and founder of the practice Spirit Medicine, which provides alternative holistic wellness services with a mission to help BIPOC individuals connect with their bodies through breath and movement. Aubrey is also the co-founder of Philodose, a social psychedelic club and agency that hosts conscious events that spread awareness and education about psychedelics as a tool to advance mental health. Welcome, Aubrey. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Jade, for having me. I'm really excited. I've been a big fan of your podcast over the last like two months, listening to all different types of interviews that you've done and just really fits in and aligns with the work that I do and what I'm most interested in in my life. So yeah, I'm excited to be on. Oh, well, I'm really excited to have you here. And I'm so excited to get into the topic of today, but before we do that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do? Totally. Yeah. So, um, hi everybody listening. My name is Aubrey. I'm speaking to you from the occupied land of the Lenape tribe. I'm certified breathwork and psychedelic assisted facilitator based in Philadelphia. I previously served as a ketamine assisted psychotherapy facilitator at the Sound Mind Institute, as well as a guest instructor for their psychedelic facilitator course, which was amazing. And I had the opportunity to help and assist train over 200 facilitators nationwide. That was a really beautiful um, transition for me because for a very long time, I've worked underground in other countries and had the opportunity to travel a bit working with psychedelic medicine. Um, So I I was able to shift from the underground to the above ground and learn what it's like to work in a clinical setting. So that was really, really interesting for me. Um, A little bit more about my background. I'm also a certified vinyasa krama and yin yoga facilitator. That's where I got my start um, when I first got into psychedelic work, which we'll talk more about in a moment. um, There wasn't really a path forward in working in 
uh, this field in a legal way. So for me, I knew that I had to enter through a different pathway and that started with yoga and learning to connect with the body and the spiritual elements that are really deeply intertwined there. And that led to breath work as well. Um, you know, I feel that I'm a plant medicine ally and activist. I, I believe that all people should have access to these medicines and um, just any way that feels best for them to heal personally. I think that we have the right as humans and beings on this planet to work with nature and to utilize nature for healing. That's really important to me. Um, I also help people, particularly people of color, connect with their bodies through breath and movement as a way to practice liberation. And more recently, I'm now the co-founder of Philidose, which is a BIPOC-led psychedelic agency that has a social mission to facilitate healing and really just create more connected and vibrant lives through diverse and inclusive community containers and experiences. Um, and something that for me feels very important is that you know the work that I do with breath and sacred plant medicines is also a response to the impact that colonialism and capitalism has had on people, particularly BIPOC communities, marginalized communities and people. And, you know, people of color are consistently experiencing personal, historic and intergener intergenerational trauma every day. Right? We feel it all of the time. And so we're hardwired through our past experiences so really what's happening is that our brains and our bodies are holding the memory of everything that's happened to us, um, which we're just learning about now. You know, the study of epigenetics really teaches us that we, you know, we are programmed from our past and from our ancestry and what our ancestors have experienced up to seven generations back lives within our body and even can change our DNA. So, you know, we think we talk about the collective unconscious and how much that can impact us sometimes, you know, as we grow in our spiritual practice or in whatever practice that feeds us and nourishes our, our soul, we sometimes can notice that we have thoughts that maybe don't even feel like ours. And I think that's really part of this, this cycle of trauma or even feelings in the body or health issues that we're dealing with. And so over time, this leads to suppression of emotions and traumas which essentially reduce our breathing capacity, limiting our life force. So cultivating an ongoing practice of breath work or a somatic practice of yoga, or even a practice of working with medicine in an intentional way really can allow one to integrate these difficult experiences as they're happening rather than cont continuing to suppress them and just create more internal conflict, more resistance that then gets passed down to further generations or even expressed in the way that we are behaving or these unconscious actions that we that we take. So um, this is, you know, this is really personal to me. And it's just something that I've always felt is really, really important for, for me personally to be on a healing journey and that I can't help anyone else until I've helped myself. Um, so that to me is always the priority to focus on what is, uh, what helps us to move in a way that's more intentional, more ceremonial in our lives. And then we can spread that energy out to our friends, our family, our community, and then hopefully our environment. Because that to me is, that's everything, you know, Mother Earth provides for us in incredible ways. And we see that there's just so much damage and so much harm being done to our earth and the only home that we have. So in all of the work that I do, um, highlighting, you know, people of color and their traditions and practices are like paramount to me. And also hopefully that we can kind of take this information and these practices and these traditions and use it to really expand our collective consciousness and begin to form a more um, a more harmonious relationship with the earth where there is reciprocity. So, yeah. That is so beautiful. You're doing so much amazing work. So thank you for everything that you do. Um, and I'm Thank excited you. to get more into it. Um, Thank you. Specifically with psychedelics, I guess my next question for you is, um, what led you to working with psychedelics? 
Mm, that's a great question. That's a long story and I'm excited to share a piece of it with you all. So I guess to start with this, you know, I have always felt drawn personally to the mystical and to ways of healing that are non-traditional. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit of a rebel at heart and I think a lot of our generation is, to be honest. I think we've grown up in a time, I'm a millennial, where we see that our systems are broken. And not even that they're broken, right? But they have been designed to um, continuously oppress people and minority groups specifically. And that has kind of always led to a lot of inner angst and inner conflict for me. Um, and so, you know, to bring it back a little bit further, I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness, I'm no longer in that religion, um, but I was in it for, you know, a long, a long portion of my life until I was around 21. And when I was in that religion, I didn't have the opportunity to explore alternative ways to heal, right? So different practices such as yoga, meditation, breath work, these things were really not available to me at the time. And so I had this, I felt that I had this like deep connection with God. And at the time, God was this masculine being that was outside of myself, right? That I would pray to at night. And there was a lot of fear mentality in the space too. And with a lot of religions, you know, I believed Armageddon was coming and these are st still things that I am healing from, right? This um, sense of fear and, and hypervigilance in my nervous system that's really like been hardwired and programmed for a long time. So now there's a lot of like work to unlearn these patterns and these behaviors and these limiting beliefs. Um, and so not having the opportunity to connect spiritually in the way that I really, really wanted to, I did always feel like something was missing. Fast forward, you know, many years until I was a young adult. I had my children really young. I had my daughter at 19, had my son at 21. I got married and I kind of did the whole thing that I thought I was supposed to do and found myself really unhappy in that situation. You know, I'm so grateful and happy to be a mother, um, but it's very challenging, especially not having the support that you need and not having the tools to support your mental health specifically. Um, so I found myself dealing with postpartum depression and not even really knowing it at the time. And then I had a big, big change in my life and a really um, traumatic moment where my, my best friend from high school and college Taylor passed away due to suicide and I wasn't friends with her at the time. I had disassociated because I had gotten reinvolved in my religion. Um, so, you know, brought a lot of pain and confusion for me in that space. And I think that I could describe that really as, you know, as like my dark night of the soul, where it really woke me up to just understanding and just wanting more clarity in what I was doing and the direction I was going in my life. Um, and so I had really a, a pretty magical opportunity where I had seen DMT, the spirit molecule. It's one of the, like the first uh, psychedelic documentaries, at least that I had watched around like six, seven years ago. This is around 2016. And a coworker showed it to me when, when we were at work. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. If I had the opportunity to, and it highlighted ayahuasca um, a lot in that, in that documentary and the work that Rick Strassman has done with DMT. And I was like, man, if I had the opportunity to, you know, in my mind, in my limited framework at the time, I thought it was like only in Peru. And, I, you know, I didn't know much at all about, about this medicine, these medicines. And I said, you know, if I could have the opportunity to experience that and to relive certain experiences in my life to heal from them and specifically to kind of regain memory that I had blocked off due to certain childhood experiences, I was like, that would be incredible. So I think naturally I've always been very open to alternative practices and things of that nature where some people there's a lot more fear there. And I, at the time, had no prior experience with psychedelic work. I had only uh, experienced cannabis and worked with cannabis. And so it was really intriguing to me. And I never thought that I would have the opportunity to do it. For one, 
how was I going to fly to Peru? I didn't have enough money. I was a young mother. And two, I didn't think anyone would be able to go with me. And I was too nervous to go on my own. You know, I needed that support. I felt that I needed that support at the time. Um, and then about a month later, my father called me up and he said, you know, I was just down in Costa Rica and was in ayahuasca ceremonies and I'm going to send you and your sister down. And so for one, I was blown away. I was like, what a coincidence. And now I can view that very much as a synchronicity. And I do very much believe that the medicine calls you when you're ready, you know, and for me to have ayahuasca kind of brought to my awareness a month prior and really had this like spark of interest in the medicine and felt that I could really use that type of like deep, deep healing. And then to have that call and have the ability to go and, and journey down there and experience it for the first time for myself, really, um, it really changed my life. And I do want to say it's important to mention that I was very privileged in being able to fly to Costa Rica and experience the medicine at a retreat center. Not everyone has that opportunity. Um, so I'm very grateful for that experience. And there are many other ways to experience the medicine outside of a retreat center, you know, as well. Um, but that was my first experience with psychedelic medicine. And, you know, a lot of people would will say that maybe you don't go to ayahuasca as your first experience. Um, because ayahuasca is one of the most powerful hallucinogens known to man. Um, but for me, I had a really healthy dose of fear. And at the time, I, I really needed it. I was extremely depressed. I had so much anxiety because I felt like I had no direction and no, no passion in my life at the time. Um, and so for me, that, that really changed, changed everything. And so during the course of the week, and those, those four ceremonies, I did three ceremonies in total. I was able to experience so much of the fear that I've had from my religion, from different traumatic events in childhood, and realize the way in which they were playing out in subconscious patterns in my life and in relationship. And I also, from those ceremonies, was able to surrender. I think that was a huge part of that, that experience for me and so many people that it's, we have so many walls and these protectors that we create for ourselves that at one point in our lives serve us really well. And then we move through different moments and we grow and we learn as we, as we mature. And those protectors that one, at one point in our lives really served us and protected us are at this point in this stage of our lives only blocking us and inhibiting us from really being able to express the fullness of who we are and the fullness of the self. Um, and so those protectors slowly began to, to release and to soften through those ceremonies and having the supportive environment was really important for me as well. And one really powerful moment during the last journey, as I mentioned to you all, that my friend had passed away and that kind of started this process for me. I was I was lying there on the mat and in an ayahuasca ceremony, you know, these these traditions go back, you know, hundreds of thousands of years with indigenous people and communities working with these medicines in a very sacred way. And so during the ceremony, we were laying on our mats and the corenderos were walking around and the assistants with the various tools that they have to support them and their energetic clearings and, and, and different things. And I remember the corendero came over to me and waved the huayra, which is like these beautiful leaves that help to clear energy. And in that moment, all of the pain, and I was in so much extreme pain, and all of the pain seemed to really melt away. It actually, like, it was, like, miraculous. It's, like, all of a sudden, it was, like, snap. It was all gone. And I had this, like, wave and this sensation of ultimate peace and ultimate joy. And in that moment, it felt like the sky, I was indoors, but it felt like the ceiling kind of slowly dissipated. And I could see the night sky with all of the amazing stars and I could hear my friend's voice, Taylor, literally speaking to me as if she was there. I mean, I didn't see her physical body, 
but I can tell you with 100% certainty, she appeared and she was there, her energy was present. And she said something to the effect of, I'm okay. You know, like I'm okay. And for me, that was so powerful because I was suicidal at the time. Now, at least I had suicidal ideation. I was in a really bad place prior to that journey or those journeys. And I remember like rolling up into a ball and just like bawling my eyes out. You know, those, those like tears that are from your soul when you're weeping. And in that moment, I remember saying to myself, like, I want to live. I'm just repeating that, like, I want to live. And just that, that really changed my life. And so, you know, medicine is not a magic pill, but the supportive container in which I was able to experience that medicine really did um, help to clear my depression in a way that I've never experienced it come back since then. So that's, that's a little piece of the beginning of my psychedelic journey. That is such a beautiful story, and oh, yeah, I don't know, it gives me chills uh, thinking about that. I think that that's such a beautiful way to like enter into the space, having had that experience yourself, um, and I can imagine it makes the work like even more meaningful. Um, my my next question is just like getting into psychedelic assisted therapy like what is it and how long has it been around i know you talked briefly about how this comes from um indigenous practices so can you talk some more about the history yeah totally the history is really fun to explore because there's such a long history here so in terms of a definition, um, I like a definition that Numinous Health uses that basically states that psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So for one, I guess before I say that, there's psychedelic assisted therapy. So I do psychedelic assisted therapy facilitation because I'm not a licensed therapist. And there's also psychedelic assisted psychotherapy um, where there's a trained clinician in the room that is working with someone to specifically do psychotherapy in conjunction with the medicine. So essentially, psychedelic therapy involves the use of psychedelic substances such as psilocybin, MDMA, and ketamine for the purpose of facilitating therapeutic breakthroughs and insight. Um, so that's one definition. And, you know, as we're speaking about this and having this dialogue, I think it's super important, as you just mentioned, to remember that we're speaking to what our ancestors have known for millennia. Now, psychedelic medicines are sacred plants, and they've been used by indigenous peoples for thousands of years to heal both the body, the mind, and the spirit. And so just acknowledging that these practices are ancient and that we're really just catching up to the potentials that these medicines hold for healing. So we wanna hold them with respect and honor and really make it a point to learn about the cultures that have and the peoples who have carried these medicines for all of this time. Because we, we see that there is a long history of oppression and, you know, as the West and as the modern society begins to catch up to some of this work, we see these people who have carried these medicines, typically people of color and those from minority communities, are left out of the conversation. And I think that it's great in the sense that, you know, as we see the psychedelic renaissance really beginning to take foot and take hold in the United States, we see that there are so many organizations that are, you know, putting up land acknowledgements on their websites and creating different scholarship funds and initiatives for indigenous peoples. And that's super important. And we just wanna make sure that it's not a cover. You know, we can see tokenism used a lot as well, where it's a person of color is highlighted in different graphics and media, but the internal organization and the the people who are at the top of the organization are not representing this diversity that we maybe see in their presentation. So just like noting that first, I think is really important. So we wanna have an open dialogue about these treatments as we begin to integrate psychedelics into our current societal and mental health framework, frameworks. And so let's get into like the history a little bit because it is super interesting. So kind of go way back for a moment. Psychoactive plants and fungi have been used in pre-Columbian Mesoamerican cultures for centuries. 
And as we look at the many traditions that include techniques for accessing expanded states of consciousness, we really see that they consider these medicines sacred and use them in ceremony and ritual as a way to cleanse the mind, body, and spirit of any patterns of disharmony that may exist, right? So there's like patterns of disease and dis-ease when we're having so much resistance and inner conflict, whether that's mentally in the, in the mental body, whether that's in the physical body, and then it just begins to get expressed. And so we know from different shamanic practices that energy is where everything starts. Everything starts on the energetic level and then begins to get manifested into the physical. And so if we have trauma from our childhood, specifically childhood trauma, that is extremely hard to treat. And we see in different studies and research that the younger someone experiences trauma, the harder it is for them to really receive remission and to heal in a, in a whole, whole way. And so when we work with certain medicines, they allow us to get into the energetic level and begin to heal from the root cause, which we see in modern medicine and Western medicine, there's a huge problem where we're treating the symptoms and the whole system is designed to treat the symptoms, typically with medication, something outside of the body. And a lot of these medications are derived from plants and even the same plants that are made illegal for this type of use. And it's not actually allowing us to heal. We're just putting a Band-Aid on the real problem. So when we work with psychedelic medicine, especially in an, in an intentional way, we're able most of the time to get to the root of the trauma. And so it allows us deeper access to healing, which I think is super important. So going back to the tradition for a moment, you know, cultures and lineages, there's different indigenous populations, mostly in Central and South America, also as well in Africa and North America and spread throughout different parts of the world. They've maintained traditional use of psychedelic substances despite hundreds of years of colonization and oppressive forces. So I think that's really important just to note the amount of resilience that people have had and making sure that their practices will continue to be carried on and that their cultures will continue to be upheld. I think that's so important. And so in ceremonial and ritual use, there's evidence that shows that people have been using psycho psychoactive substances for millennia to heal all kinds of disorders. So we talk about seizures, um, we talk about headaches, cluster headaches, depression, and different neurological disorders and mental health disorders that are treated in the context of ritual ceremonies and sometimes using different medicines. And if these medicines have been used throughout all of human history, how did they begin to make their way into the counterculture movement of the 60s and the 70s in the West? And so we kind of move down the timeline into the 60s and the 70s, which most people, that's, that's usually what they're most familiar with. We talk about like the hippies and we talk about Woodstock. So until the mid 20th century, the use of psychoactive substances remain in the context of religious and ceremonial use. Important to know. And then research on psychedelics began after Albert Hoffman discovered the hallucinogenic properties of LSD in 1943. So he coined the term psychedelic, meaning mind manifesting, which is a very appropriate term. And in 1955, there was a famous banker, a lot of people know this story, named Gordon Wasson, who returned from traveling in Mexico, where he met a curandera, a traditional Mexican healer named Maria Sabina, who introduced him to psilocybin mushrooms. And he wrote a super famous magazine article in 1957 entitled Seeking the Magic Mushroom. So this is really cool because up until this point, there wasn't that much news and media around psychedelics. And so to some degree, this opened Pandora's box that, you know, would see, among other things, the birth of the American psychedelic counterculture movement and also the shift from the ritual use to recreational use. And so kind of the 
the information we get after that time and from that shift is that we see the banning of psychedelics across much of the world and this massive propaganda campaign that began around that time. And so in the 1970s, the War on Drugs and Controlled Substances Act essentially rendered psilocybin illegal and also many other drugs, mescaline, LSD, marijuana that was linked to the Mexicans at the time. And it put a halt on all of the research. So there was research from the 1950s to around the 1970s, amazing research that was being done around using these psychedelic substances to treat a wide array of mental health disorders. And clinicians and, and doctors were seeing amazing results that they weren't seeing with the let's say, quote unquote, traditional drugs that they were using at the time or the traditional treatments that they were using at the time. So what's really interesting about this when we speak about this in the context of the effects on people of color is that the war on drugs um, was later outed by a former policy advisor as a cover up to criminalize black people and hippies. And he also told a journalist that we knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war on blacks or the war on drugs. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, we could criminalize both heavily and we could disrupt those communities. So this is really, I mean, it's insane to hear that and to, to know that that's the case. And I mean, it makes it so difficult to trust the government. And we've seen kind of these scandals come out over and over and over again. And this is part of the reason that people of color have so much distrust in the government, that the war on drugs totally criminalized people for being black and or for being a person of color. And then the effect of this is we saw hundreds and thousands of black bodies being shipped into prisons, into the prison industrial complex, and for minor, minor charges, like carrying a, a gram of marijuana. And it's, I mean, it just blows my mind how, how disproportionate uh, the justice system is and how we see the criminalization of, of people based on this cover-up of the war on drugs. So I think that's really important to note when we go back into the history. And so let's bring it into the modern history a little bit and where we're at today. People are calling this like the psychedelic renaissance. Some people agree with that definition, some people don't. But today people use psychedelics in a wide variety of settings. So we have religious and ceremonies, um, spiritual quests, personal development, and also more recreationally now, you know, in settings like raves, music festivals, and just the comfort of people's homes, which is great. And I think more recently, there's the therapeutic uses for psychedelics that have made these inroads in established institutions. I think it's pretty amazing that we're seeing different universities now having whole um, whole aspects of their university that are specifically devoted to research for psychedelic substances. Um, so we can talk about the movement in general as it's happening right now in the West, that there are some states and even several city, cities in the United States that are loosening laws around psychedelics, which is so exciting. We're seeing like news articles pop up all the time. Most of the time we're getting them on Instagram or LinkedIn, right? And there are currently two frameworks for the psychedelic movement. So first is the legalization movement, which is spearheaded by the current research and clinical studies that are being conducted. And this, is, this would essentially allow for therapeutic use of psychedelics in a controlled setting with a trained facilitator or therapist. And then the second is the nationwide decriminalization movement, urging states to decriminalize psychedelic plants and fungi for at-home cultivation and use. So we kind of see are seeing two tracks and some people are for one against the other or both. Um, my personal opinion is that I think both are necessary because one, we need decriminalization so that we are not continuously seeing black and brown bodies being shipped off into these prisons. I think that is huge in terms of our, our communities and also for people to have access to be able to grow and cultivate their own medicine. You know, this, these are the, 
the plants that nature, mother nature and the earth has given us for use. So why should humans have the right to criminalize these, these medicines and really just these plants? And then second, you know, for me, I have two perspectives because I have come from the underground world and then moved into the above ground world working in a clinical setting. Legalization, I think, is also very important because there are some people who are on a more traditional path and have followed frameworks that are set up and establishments for a long time. And so somebody that might have cancer, let's just say, maybe would not feel as comfortable going into an underground ceremony or flying to Costa Rica or to Peru and also access around this too, because some of these medicines are not legalized. Most of them are not yet. So it can be costly and time consuming to be able to fly to another country to have access to these medicines. And so for someone that is struggling with a like physical disorder or even a mental health disorder, maybe they feel more comfortable going to a local clinician or a local clinic to receive these treatments, right? So there is a whole large group of people of the population who would only feel comfortable experiencing these medicines in a medical setting. Um, and so just to note that there's so much diversity in all different aspects of life and, and human society. And so I think that decriminalization and legalization is important um, for allowing all of us, all humans to have access in different ways. But there's a lot of conversation and dialogue that has to happen to ensure safety and access as we take these different paths. So that's a that's a overview of some of the history of psychedelic medicine. Yeah, it always oh, frustrates me so much to hear about just the period in the 60s and 70s and 80s when, yeah, the war on drugs began and how this affected so many facets of life. So, yeah, very frustrating, but um, I am, I, I know p p people are, some people are indifferent about this psychedelic renaissance that we're in now, and I think that there's some aspects of it that are very, very, um, I guess, just not inclusive, but I think it's also a great start um, to getting back on track to where we were when we were doing research before. I agree 100%. Yeah. It's like the research in our current society is what we need. We need science. Science is important and it's valuable. Um, and with that, we definitely want to bridge this gap between science and spirituality because spirituality, as we've grown in our understanding of science in the West, has largely been left out and put in this box of religious context. But there's so many different ways to experience spirituality. And for me, that's what the medicine gave me, specifically my first experiences with ayahuasca and my experiences with psilocybin, that it allowed me to feel the essence and the spirit of the universe within myself, within everything around me, that everything is alive and we can't separate as much as we do and isolate as much as we do to continue this stage of late stage capitalism, you know, continue this pathway of consumerism and exploitation that doesn't lead to anywhere. You know, it only leads to destruction. And so when we can create this like holistic model of, or even holistic framework of how we approach psychedelic medicine and where it can go and the potential it has, we have the opportunity then to use a similar holistic and integrated framework into every aspect of our lives. So I think that is so, so necessary. Yeah, and my next question, um, it was like, what is psychedelic assisted therapy for? And, and like, who is it recommended for? But I feel like you just po pointed to this holistic part of it where it's not necessarily for like one thing specifically. Um, so yeah, maybe yeah. could you talk about maybe like what it, in the West people recommend psychedelic assisted therapy for? Yeah, totally. So I think it would be helpful to go through kind of a list of the different 
psychedelics and how they're used to treat different disorders and you know what people they can be supportive for but i do love what you just mentioned that you know like who is psychedelic assisted therapy for i think it can be for everyone but it's also not for everyone so making that distinction is a little tricky but i think important to discuss because it can be super therapeutic in treating and healing a wide array of mental and even physical health conditions but we have to approach it with with caution and making sure safety is at the front of what we're doing. And so when we're working with psychedelic medicine, when we're doing like a medical intake with someone, intakes are very important because it allows us to get a person's full history and background. And typically medical intakes have been focused on the medical history, right? As the name implies. And I think lately specifically we've been able to have more dialogue and open conversation about the importance of cultural sensitivity in this work. And so in my medical intake process with people and with clients, I'm specifically asking them questions about their family history, um, their language, what type of music would feel best for them and most supportive for their journey. You know, there's so many different questions that we can ask that really can highlight a person's background and make them feel safe and supported because therapy works best and really only works when someone feels safe. We have to get to the root of the issue and we have to really expand the capacity of the nervous system to tolerate different sensations, right? So we can move out of a state of reactivity into a space of creation. And so when we're working with psychedelic assisted therapy, or just medicine in general, whether it's in a therapeutic context or whether it's in a ceremonial context or recreational, it's really important to note that medicine can be destabilizing. So having a solid psychological framework is key. And so it's lovely if someone has um, a support system, whether this is the family that, or the, you know, the people that they're going home to, or maybe they've been working with a therapist for X amount of years, or maybe they've done previous medical work, I'm sorry, mental health work, or maybe they have done um, medicine work and like integrated therapies. Like, this is really, really very important when we're discussing or someone's interested in working with medicine, especially for the first time, just knowing that they are stable enough to be able to go into these spaces because psychedelics expand your consciousness and they can be an amplifier of anything really, right? So knowing that it's not a magic pill and that we need to approach it with safety. So I would say that before engaging with any medicines, we have to make sure that there's no psychological or even physiological contraindications. So as psychedelics, so I'm sorry, as psychedelic medicines become decriminalized and legalized in many states, there are more medical professionals that are becoming aware of the benefits of these medicines. It's still not, we're not at the place where we need to be. And I think, you know, I think that's a really important mission for myself and my organization as well as creating resources for different mental health professionals to have and be able to understand how to work with clients when they come in and say, hey, I just did a journey and this is what came up to not fall into the same, the same stigmas or to make a patient feel um, unsafe or being able to share the, that information because these journeys create mystical type experiences that, you know, the traditional psychological framework has not always allowed us to explore. So I think that's just really, really important to note. But there are so many different resources available. So there's like the Psychedelic Support Network, there's the Fireside Project, if you're having a difficult journey and you need to call someone and, and, and receive help. Arrowhead is, a, is like a, a amazing resource. Chakruna, <clears throat> excuse me, Chakruna as well. So there's a lot of different support that we have and just like so much more information that is available compared to when I was first starting on this journey in 2016. So it's pretty amazing to me that like from the seven years within a seven year period of time, 
there's just this explosion of research, this explosion of resources available to us. Because I remember after my journeys, I was like searching on Reddit, you know, and like just trying to get just um, anecdotal information, which I think we also can't discount. Just people's personal experience. Research gives us a lot of great information, a lot of data and statistical points to analyze but also people's personal experience we cannot discount. And so we can talk about now the different psychedelics and maybe what they're beneficial for. So um, specifically ketamine is really amazing and we can get into what I work with personally in, in a moment, but ketamine, psilocybin and MDA are all currently being worked with and studied in conjunction with psychotherapy. LSD can lead to altered mood, perception, and consciousness, and potential uses include the treatment of addiction and anxiety. We see that addiction is a, a big, big problem throughout all of America. I live in Philly. The opioid crisis is really tearing our communities apart. Um, so just to know that there is potential, I think people can struggle with that that aren't familiar with the research or just the understanding and the history of these medicines. Because it's like, oh, you're going to treat a drug with a drug. Right. Sounds sounds interesting. I mean, it's already what our society does, first of all. But there's so much research that really shows the potential that different substances have in an intentional and therapeutic way with set and setting to help to reprogram some of these um, behaviors and thoughts and feelings, which can be instrumental in affecting long term change. And so we have psilocybin love psilocybin. It's amazing because earth medicines are, you know, it's where my heart really, really lies because the earth gives us these medicines. And even LSD, you know, is taken from, from a plant as well. So almost everything is derived from plants. So like LSD, psilocybin alters consciousness, mood, and perceptions. And it's being studied for its use in the treatment of addiction, anxiety, and depression. Um, some of the research around psilocybin and depression is incredible. And MDMA, also known commonly as ecstasy, it's not a classic psychedelic substance, but it is a drug that produces psychedelic effects, including feelings of euphoria, altered perception, increased arousal, let me say increased feelings of openness. And research suggests it has therapeutic potential in the treatment of PTSD. So MDMA is really, really being highlighted by an organization called MAPS, and they are the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. They've received millions of dollars in funding, really privately funded uh, largely. And this is because people really want to see these medicines working for a healing different, different disorders. And so PTSD and veterans has been a huge in allowing the research to move forward um, because PTSD is chronically hard to treat. It's so difficult to treat because the amygdala is continuously kind of like sending off a smoke alarm to the nervous system when there's any type of fragmented trigger, whether that's like a sight, uh, a sound, a smell, a taste even. And so then we're seeing so much reactivity and hypervigilance and so many of these veterans returning from war or from being in other countries and are not able to live a functional life and not nearly as much attention or treatment has gone into uh, what they need to, to help heal from, from the different experiences that they've had. So MDMA has really kind of been this like gateway in helping push, I think, this whole movement forward. And it has started with the treatment of PTSD and veterans. So I think that's super interesting. And then to kind of conclude this bit for now, ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, I think, is where my heart really is. And this brew originates in South America. And it helps with addiction, anxiety, depression, and I think it's really, really one of the most amazing medicines because it has such a long history of traditional and ceremonial use. Um, so it's not being studied in a typical way. Um, and we also have mescaline, um, which is from a cactus. 
and there's other psychedelics as well, but these are the main ones that, you know, are really, I think, being worked with in very intentional ways. Hi friends, Jade here. I wanted to pop in because this episode is pretty long and I know it can be a bit overwhelming to consume so much information in one sitting. So I encourage you to take all the time you need to listen to this episode and take this moment with me to take three deep breaths before we continue with the show. First, let's exhale and release all of the breath that we currently have. And let's begin. Breathe in. And breathe out. Breathe in. And breathe out. Breathe in. And breathe out. All right, let's get back into the show. Um, in your practice, which psychedelics do you work with? Mm, great question. So I have done work with psilocybin and ayahuasca holding space and facilitating overseas and other countries in a ceremonial context. And in the U.S., specifically with ketamine, I had the opportunity to work at the Sound Mind Center or Sound Mind Institute in West Philly for a little over a year as a ketamine-assisted therapy facilitator. And that was such an amazing journey for me, getting to come into a clinical setting and bring in some of my ceremonial practices So offering cleansings, energetic cleansings for people when they come in, if they're interested. And if not, that's fine. Sometimes we'd offer to pull a tarot card. You know, this is not something typical you see when you go to like a doctor's office. But it was beautiful having the chance to kind of weave in these different practices into a more clinical setting and seeing really beautiful results, too, because the above ground world, the medical world, has really important safety measures. I think that the underground world can always and should always draw from, such as informed consent, um, specifically around touch. Uh, touch in a psychedelic journey can be really powerful. And I, I'm a big, big proponent of it when it's done um, with consent and done very intentionally. So walking through an informed consent process with a patient beforehand, we would ask the person to lie down on the bed or the couch and let's explore these different areas that touch would feel safe. So areas that we would explore would be underneath the head, maybe holding of the feet or the hands um, or the shoulder or an elbow. And just using those places of the body, safe spaces, and giving the patient the opportunity to say no and discussing what it's like if during the journey they change their mind, how to express that going through. Well, this is kind of getting into preparation a little bit. So let's talk about ketamine for a moment because ketamine is really an amazing medicine that is accessible to some degree. It's accessible in the fact that it is legal. Um, So that's a big step forward, I think, for us in terms of Cost, not very accessible. Um, So we do run into issues there. But to give anyone who is listening an overview of what it is, if you're not familiar, ketamine is an FDA-approved anesthetic and is available for off-label prescription by a licensed clinician. So off-label 
is when a medicine is used to treat another condition outside of its original medical intent. So ketamine has been approved by the FDA for medical use as an anesthetic in surgery since 1970. Um, so I know on the street, people have, you know, call it special K, talk about the K-hole, there's all these different terms. I mean, people, people have a misconception that it's a horse anesthetic, things like this, right? So it's important to know just the medical use that it's been around for a really long time. And it was really cool in one of our, in one of our experiential trainings, we had a beautiful facilitator and medical doctor who's an anesthesiologist who's been working with ketamine, giving ketamine to patients for, for many, many years and has never worked with it as a psychedelic substance. So he had the opportunity of taking the medicine and working with ketamine in this way. And it was really, really cool to kind of just see, and he's also a curandero, so he's got the traditional ceremonial background. And so it kind of came full circle in his experience of the medicine. So it's a dissociative. So when you're taking ketamine, you are lying there typically with eye shades on, there's music on in the room, you have your facilitator with you, maybe two facilitators possibly, you've gone through the whole consent process and preparation process, and you take the medicine, you're working with lozenges, you hold it in your mouth for a certain amount of time, protocol changes depending on which clinic you're working with or which, which prescriber or facilitator you're working with. And then you either swallow the medicine or you spit it out and you go into your journey. And it's actually short acting compared to like a psilocybin journey. That's four to six hours, ayahuasca, eight hours, potentially ketamine can be about an hour and a half to two hours, probably three hours max. And that's usually when you're in a group setting, it will go longer because the energy is like so powerful with more people, which is so fascinating to me. And a little bit of a note on ketamine in terms of like the research and the benefits, because it's really, really cool. In one study, large scale peer reviewed study, 89% of the participants reported improvement in their depression and anxiety symptoms. And 63% of participants experienced a greater than 50% reduction. And then for both depression and anxiety, over 30% achieved remission or virtually no symptoms after four sessions. Um, and also, I want to note that ketamine has different routes of administration. So it can be taken in the form of a trochee or a lozenge in the mouth. It can also be intramuscular as a shot in the arm, typically in the upper arm. Um, it also can be done intravenously, so with an IV. So we're seeing a lot of IV ketamine clinics pop up. My preference is the lozenge. I think it's great for having, or just, I think, I think the lozenge is amazing for this relational aspect. If you're working with a client or a patient in a therapeutic way, it allows people to have like a, not softer journey necessarily, but not so rapid not so quick and not so intense that you're kind of blown out into space, shot into space, and then you walk back and you're like, what just happened? Kind of gives you like a tail end at the beginning and the end. Um, and so I do want to mention that with IV, one of the benefits to IVs is that um, there's like 62% of participants who reported suicidal ideation at baseline no longer reported any suicidal ideation after four sessions with IV. So it's really amazing. I think about, you know, a lot of my journey started because of my friend committing suicide and passing away. And if I had known or we had known collectively that IV ketamine was such a powerful and effective treatment for suicidal ideation, it could it can really change a lot of lives and save a lot of lives. So I think that's just really important to note. Yes, I can also speak to that. Uh, ketamine has been my like introduction into the psychedelic space. And yeah, it's worked wonders for my depression. And yeah, I just love that you went so in depth about it because I feel like, again, people have these conceptions of like the K-hole or things like that and still ha make ketamine seem like this scary like party drug 
Um, yeah, totally. And you know, what's interesting yeah. about that too, is like what you just mentioned is really important because when people are doing recreationally, typically they're taking much smaller amounts. So like in a therapeutic setting, we're working with like a hundred milligram lozenge at the lowest to at the max four or 500 milligrams. And in comparison, when you're taking it on the street or recreationally, maybe you're doing like 20 or 30 milligrams, like very small. People are usually snorting it, very different experience. And then for anesthetic doses, it's way, way higher. So, and I don't know the exact um, amounts there, but so, you know, the psychedelic and the therapeutic range is really between like 100 milligrams to four to 500 milligrams. So that's just cool, you know, kind of cool to know, I think, dosage. I always want to highlight that, like, know your dose. If you're taking medicine recreationally or therapeutically, intentionally, whatever, know your dose. Buy a yeah. scale. It's not very expensive. It's, it's pretty cheap, actually. And there's so many resources out there where you can, like, find out what is what are low doses, medium doses, heroic doses, what is microdosing, you know, so that you can then find the dose that works for you best and continue to adjust it as you go. So... I think that's just like taking back our power personally. We don't have to leave it all up to the doctor, or even the therapist. Let's talk about it. Let's get to know what that's like for you. Yeah, I like that. So you talked a little bit about set and setting. Um, so I guess in, in your practice, can you talk about like the ways that you prepare your patients for a journey and then also what integration is and what that looks like. Totally. Yeah. So I think this is what people really want to know when they hear about like psychedelic assisted therapy, like what does it look like? You know, like what is happening when, when somebody goes into this space and, you know, just from a very, let's say basic perspective, not even basic, but a high level perspective, a lot of the the protocol we get and, and clinicians and facilitators use really comes from the research and like the clinical setting, like two or three prep sessions. And that is done virtually or in person where you're sitting down with the patient or the client, you're discussing their intentions, you're discussing their, you're going over their medical intake and kind of continuously just getting to know them better and, and fostering and building a, a strong relationship so that the person feels safe. As we mentioned before, when you go into a psychedelic journey, you go into a highly suggestible state where the veil between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind begins to thin. This is, this is why we're able to see so much neuroplasticity and so many rewiring of our circuits and our programs, literally in our brain and our nervous system, which is amazing. And with that being said, there is potential for abuse. And so we really, really need to make sure that as anyone who's approaching a journey is able to ask the right questions to the facilitator and vet the person that they're working with, make sure they have either a lineage or good, solid experience with this medicine. Um, so you're having these prep sessions, you're going over all of this information, you're going through the informed consent process, like we just mentioned a moment ago. And informed consent is not only just what it's like in terms of touch, but it's also like all of the logistics. Like if you're in a journey and you have to use the bathroom, what do we do? <laughs> you know, in a ketamine, in a ketamine session, you have your eye shades on. Most psychedelic journeys, you probably have your eye shades on, especially therapeutically. And with ketamine specifically, if you take your eye shades off too early in the journey, it can really like take you out of it, out of the medicine and you might shorten the experience. So if you have to go to the bathroom 20 minutes in, you probably want to keep your eye shades on. So we do something called the bathroom train. We get up and hands on the shoulders and you kind of like real slowly. It's like a, it's like a fun conga line. Get a, You get opportunity to kind of like laugh and joke together in that way. Super trippy for the person that's in the medicine. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a wild experience. So like all logistics like that, if somebody wants to change the song, if a song is triggering to them, you know, maybe let's explore why is it triggering to you? And, um, and maybe it's just that you don't like the song and you have the ability to ask me as your facilitator to change it and letting the person know that they are supported and I'm here to act as your support in whatever you need. 
And so this comes up in really funny and interesting ways. When we're talking about body work and we go to the feet, it's very interesting that a lot of people will be like, oh, I'm good. You don't need to touch my feet. And then we ask a follow-up question. I'll ask a question of, you know, why is that? Is it, have you had some trauma around your feet? Is there something that comes up for you in, in that space of your body? And oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes it's like, oh, I didn't shower today. So I'm like, okay, don't worry about that. You know, like I, it's totally fine for me um, to, to hold your feet and to support you in this way. And if you'd like, we can do it with the covers and the blanket over your feet. You know, so like going through all these little details um, with ketamine, holding the lozenge in your mouth for 15 minutes, which is really just holding your saliva in your mouth, freaks people out. And they're like, how am I going to do this? Probably have never held saliva in their mouth for that long. Didn't know what happens when you do it, that your cheeks buff out. It's very interesting. So going through that, and you just really want to make sure people feel as safe and as comfortable and as informed as possible. You can never really describe what a psychedelic journey itself is like. Um, but if you're working with ketamine or you're working with psilocybin or ayahuasca, it is important as the facilitator in, a, in your responsibility to do your best to describe in general what are some of the themes that come up, what are some of the archetypes that are that are typical in these spaces. Um, so with ketamine, for example, we see in a lot of psychedelics, we see a lot of birth and death themes. Sometimes there's this feeling, often there's this feeling of like, traveling and movement with ketamine and uh, architecture and shapes that you don't get in other journeys. Psilocybin is very body focused. It can be where you really get into your emotions and you feel a lot, you know, in ayahuasca, there can be these really powerful visuals and whole body kind of uh, experience. So each medicine is, is different and being able to explain it to some degree is I think very important and helpful for the patient to feel uh, safe going into the journey and especially people for their first time that don't really have a frame of reference. And I do wanna point out that I love working with patients over a series of journeys. And so when we're talking about prep and integration, what this looks like, we do those prep sessions, however many the person decides is needed based on that person's level of experience or just what they're their goals are in this process, what their intentions are, then you have your journeys, which are typically like the peak experience. But I think we want to get a move away from that mindset or that framework of like the journeys being the peak, because it's really the whole thing. It's this very integrated approach where we can have this huge, amazing journey with all of these insights and downloads and yet feel, and, the, and yet leave the ceremony and not do the integration work and it becomes just a memory of like oh my god i was like in space and i saw my grandma and, and all these things i think this is where integration really comes into play when we're talking about integration um again you know we can see different ways in which we approach this this can be a series of two to three sessions where we're either meeting virtually or in person to discuss what the journey was like and what you know what that brought up for you what similarities come up for you from those experiences um, but there's not one way to approach integration and so like the a definition that i like is the process by which the material accessed and insights gained in an entheogenic experience psychedelic experience or incorporated over time into one's life in a way that benefits the individual and their community um, so I think that's a really beautiful, comprehensive definition. And as we look at the many traditions that include techniques for accessing expanded states of consciousness, we see that they consistently emphasize the process of preparation and integration. And so indigenous people consider these expanded states to be times for healing and communion with spirit, and they enter it with reverence and care. So as we're approaching this new age of psychedelic medicine and treatment in the West, I think it's super important and necessary for us to look at these traditions of the people who have carried these medicines for so long and honor and utilize these tools and practices to help us integrate our journeys. So for me, I am a breathwork facilitator. Breathwork and psychedelics have gone hand in hand since around the 1960s when research was first banned. 
So Stan and Christina Groff developed holotropic breathwork, which kind of was this like first big name modality that helped people begin to get into altered states of consciousness, utilizing just the breath and not any additional substances. And I've studied personally transformational breath and pranayama. So I have a certain, I have a specific style that I work with and that I've created from those, those modalities. Um, but, you know, breath work can be super supportive of psychedelic therapy because it reduces stress, decreases anxiety. It also enhances psychological flexibility and supports our nervous system, which promotes emotional release, mood boosting benefits and increasing our self-esteem. So it's just a beautiful way, in my opinion, to integrate psychedelic experiences. So in my personal practice with clients and with patients, I often will have them do breathwork sessions. You know, maybe our first session is kind of a dialogue where we're discussing what came up because we're humans and we like to talk and we want to talk about it. But that only goes so far. Speech and vocabulary is very limited. Language is limited. And so using art as integration, it can be really powerful and tapping into creativity. Um, you know, having someone connect with nature, go out and take a walk, right? Do a breathwork session, a facilitated breathwork session. I love yin yoga. I think everyone should do yin yoga. I think it's such a beautiful, supportive practice that allows us to slowly and intentionally work with our body in a way that's not abrupt and jarring. Um, so I think it's just a beautiful practice because oftentimes the body gets left out and the somatic experiences we can have, the somatic releases we have in psychedelic journeys can be very profound, which is why I think body work can be really beautiful when done safely and intentionally in a journey. Um, and so when we enter these states, we're working with the mind, body, and spirit as a whole, as we've mentioned a few times now. And so when we're entering these states of consciousness, we're attempting to bring awareness to these contracted places in the body and the psyche. So it's this repressed energy, memories, and even the shadow parts of ourselves that are then like brought to the surface and into our conscious awareness, which is why we highlighted the ability or the, ne the necessity of having um, like a stable foundation going into this work because it can bring up so much. So this shadow material, has often been repressed until it becomes somewhat solid and frozen in different parts of the body. And it manifests as physiological tension and chronic tension in our body. This can be pain, grief, action, guilt, all these different emotions that can come up. And when we're in a journey and specifically in the integration process, the body and the psyche are slowly opening up to more awareness. And then there's this like enhanced flow of energy and vitality that's experienced. So really, I guess, to sum it up, before and after journey is where the work begins. And it's vital to begin exploring that process and your own unique relationship with your mind, body, and emotions. And a great way to do that is through the breath. So, you know, that's, that's really key. Yeah, I, um, just using my experience, I, I found that like, the whole process of a journey, the preparation, the actual journey and the integration has helped me just become more aware in general of myself and my feelings and my physical sensations and my body. Like, I feel like especially the preparation has forced me to like check in with things that I don't normally check in with. Um, yeah. 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 The mindfulness, right? It's like, yeah. Traditions in the East have known this for so, so long and we're just yep. starting to kind of incorporate it here. And I think the more that we can kind of go back to our roots and the roots of other cultures and those traditions and practices, to me, that that's what integration is all about. And also we don't have the same community structures in which, you know, indigenous peoples typically have. Um, and so healing in groups, group work is like the most exciting thing to me. The, the level of vulnerability that you get to experience and see from other people, feel from other people and within yourself, to me changes like everything. 
I remember during one of my first ayahuasca journeys, after there's like an integration circle and everybody's sharing and, you know, you've heard people weeping about like the passing of their children or like whatever, like the craziest experiences in life. And so getting to witness that and just be a witness to someone else, there's this, um, what is the word for it? It's like this, this practice in yoga that talks specifically about um, getting to sit or having the ability to sit with the tears of others. And in order to do that, you first have to sit with the tears of yourself. So that's kind of, to me, like sums up a lot of this work that you have to do the work for yourself first. Okay, I have only a few more questions and then we'll wrap up. So my next question is about misconceptions. So what are some of the, uh, if any, common misconceptions that you come across in your work? That's a great question. I think there are a lot of misconceptions because of the massive propaganda campaign that the U.S. government put out around the 70s and 80s and 90s. I mean, for myself, growing up as a millennial, I remember the D.A.R.E. campaign, you know, and like no drugs and just like, you know, we've I think we've all seen whether it's like we saw it personally at the time or even in newer documentaries, they show some of the history where the egg is cracked into the frying pan. This is your brain on drugs, you know, and that's scary. Like those campaigns really worked, which is um, it's crazy to me. Um, and that's the power that the media has and, and false advertising. And with that being said, I think there's still just a lot of stigma stigma around psychedelics and there are risks that can't be ignored but in general you look at the research people are really healing from these medicines especially when it's done in a safe container done intentionally done with good preparation done with good integration and we see that the risks are really minimal when, when we've set it up in this way. And so I think that's a hurdle to jump over, um, especially for people of color, which we talked about the war on drugs, that it's difficult for people of color to, you know, there's a lot of barriers around access, whether this is to research. Also, people of color have a lot of fear around being studied and being put in research, right? We think about like Tuskegee trials and, and all of these things um, can really just be a big barrier for people of color. So there's still a lot of education that needs to happen in our communities, which are ha is happening now. There's amazing organizations that I, I love and really support. The Ancestor Project in Baltimore is doing great work in the Northeast. We've got Hanifa Washington with the Fireside Project, which is a peer support project I mentioned earlier where you can call in and get support if you're in need of that during a journey. There's um, Reggie Harris from Oakland Hyphae who's doing amazing work out in the West. Um, Courtney Watson, there's just like so many awesome people that I could name. Um, Christy Strongman as well up in New York, used to work with Chakruna. So beautiful people of color that are doing this work in a really intentional way. And I also think about in terms of misconceptions, the idea that psychedelics are a magic pill, right? We like, now we see the benefit of seeing all of this media and all of these studies coming out is that, you know, people are a lot more interested. Like my uncles, my, my Jewish family, you know, people that are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s are calling me up like, hey, I just saw the New York Times article that came out about psilocybin, and, you know, all these things, which is so cool. I didn't know if we'd get to that point, especially as soon as we have. But with that being said, just to know that it isn't a magic pill, these medicines, that you don't just take it and you're healed and you're completely cured. I mean, that can happen, of course, but that there is a lot of work, as we just mentioned, that goes into this. And this is with any healing modality that you're looking to move into, whether that be yoga or breath work or meditation, you have to practice. It is a practice and it's uh building this continual relationship with the medicine. So you often don't just take it one time. You know, for me personally, I like to do higher dose journeys maybe two or three times a year. You know, it depends what medicine you're working with. Ketamine, if you're in treatment, you're doing six sessions in a period of two months or something like that. So definitely changes depending on the medicine. 
but that's what I like to do personally. And then people can microdose to kind of have that consistent relationship with the medicine. And even that you should know that you don't take it consistently over long periods of time. You do that for a specific amount of time, two to three months or something like that. So, you know, getting informed, I think is just super important when we're thinking about misconceptions and kind of moving away from the stigma and the propaganda that's been put out there around psychedelic medicine. So my next question is, so for anybody who's listening who may be interested to see if they're a fit for psychedelic assisted therapy or just like starting a journey with exploring psychedelics, what, where are some places people can start? That's a great, great question. Yeah. Because as we're saying, there's so much interest now, but it, it does feel somewhat elusive often where it's yeah. like, well, where do I go? This medicine's in general are not even legalized, you know, and just starting to be decriminalized. Like there's all this information, but what do I actually do with it? Um, and I think this creates a sense of urgency in the psychedelic ecosystem that we see. For one, with people wanting to be trained as facilitators and support this work and create more meaning in their lives, which is amazing. Um, but we see all of these training programs popping up and people go through these these programs, get certified, and there's like nowhere to, to work, you know? So there's complication because it's all just developing and it's continuously evolving and we're really at the start of it now or like the reemergence of it now. And MDMA is, is pretty close to being legalized for therapeutic use where they're in MAPS is in the phase three trials. So we're, you know, we're expecting in 2023 that MDMA might be legalized for therapeutic use, psilocybin, and it changes based on the state, their protocols, all these things. But when we're just talking about like the average person that wants to experience these medicines to heal whatever in their lives or just to experience it, let's say, I think a good place to start is just researching. You know, as I mentioned before, there are some really great um, resources for you and understanding maybe or just having getting an idea of like which medicine you might like to work with and doing the research on the contraindications. If you're taking any SSRIs, any um, any medications that might interact negatively with what medicines you're looking at. I think this is the benefit of ketamine assisted therapy and ketamine in general, that it really does allow people to work with that medicine while still being on SSRIs. I mean, that's huge because psilocybin, ayahuasca, you know, where you, MDMA, you can't do that. You have to pretty much be off um, a lot of pharmaceutical medicines. And so I think that's a really big step forward because then it might allow people to receive some benefits some decrease in their depression symptoms and then slowly begin to titrate off of their pharmaceutical medications or psychiatric medications. So then they can work with psilocybin, which is longer acting in general, the effects and, or ayahuasca, which is awesome. Um, and so just doing that research, deciding which one you're interested, kind of doing the research on the contraindications. And as we mentioned earlier, there are more and more medical professionals that are getting more informed um, around these medicines. So if it feels safe for you, maybe consider having a conversation with your medical professional, whether this be your psychiatrist, especially if you're on medications, definitely want to talk to your psychiatrist, your therapist, and see what are possibilities. And um, I think that's, that's really necessary. And then beginning to, once you kind of have taken that step, cultivating a relationship with which medicine you're working with, especially if it's a earth medicine, you know, if we're talking about like psilocybin, ayahuasca, peyote, mescaline, things like this, you know, cultivating this relationship by learning about the medicine's history itself and the cultural significance of the people who have carried that medicine, because you're working with a living substance. And just to remember that, right, that it's not the same as a, as a drug and a pill that you just take, it's not a magic pill. You're working with something that's alive and carries a spirit um, if you're talking about earth medicine specifically. So to have that respect and even that healthy dose of fear that comes along with that, you know, that these are, that's something that came up in one of my journeys recently. This is nothing to be taken lightly, especially holding space for people. It's nothing to be taken lightly because you are holding space 
as someone as someone ventures into different dimensions, energetic, spiritual dimensions, and to know that um, it's a really powerful place to be in. So there's so much work you can do, so much good you can do, and you have to be really mindful about checking yourself and not letting a sense of power or imbalance kind of come into that um, relationship. And then once you've done all of these steps, you know, cultivated that relationship, learned about the history, maybe talked to a medical professional, then potentially finding a clinic or finding a ceremony, whether you have access to travel overseas or a legal ayahuasca church in the United States, or maybe as these medicines are, thank goodness, becoming decriminalized and even legalized, maybe you travel to uh, Colorado or to Oregon for psilocybin assisted therapy. And it's amazing that we're at that point. Not every state is there. I mean, DC too, there are different dispensaries that are, that are popping up. So there's a lot more access than there used to be. I know there's a long way to go as well. Um, so, you know, finding a space in which maybe you can experience the medicine. And then if you choose to do it with somebody, this could be a long conversation here, but we're going to keep this bit short that if you choose to do it with a facilitator or a therapist or a guide, vetting them, right? Ha asking the proper questions. I know the Ancestor Project has a really great workbook and some resources around what questions to ask, because if you're not familiar with this, you don't know what to ask necessarily. So know that there's just so many resources out there um, to do the work. And an organization that I'm a co-founder of, Philidos, we also have some really great resources and we'll continue to put out more for people around safety, dosing and cultural sensitivity and all these types of things. Great, and I will make sure to link some of those resources for people to check out in the description. Um, but yeah, thank you. I think having some direction um, after hearing a bunch of information is really helpful. So I'm glad we could provide that. Um, I have one last question. Uh, this is something that I've been asking all of my guests this season because I want to put an emphasis on the importance of self-care. So my question for you is what is one thing you do each day to maintain mental wellness? Oh, I love this question. This is great. <laughs> so to maintain mental wellness and overall wellness and well-being, um, ceremony, and ritual. I mean, it ties really well into the conversation, but ceremony and ritual have been really key for me in being able to maintain a healthy relationship with the different aspects of myself, with my emotions. You know, we can live such busy lives nowadays, and there's so many external distractions. And so making sure that we're taking time, and I'm personally taking time out of my day to practice self-care. And so for me, kind of living each moment intentionally is ritual, is ceremony, you know, and I work, I like to work with um, tobacco intentionally to cleanse my body, right? Ceremonial tobacco to like cleanse my energy with Palo Santo, with sage, different herbs, um, and even prayer is something I've been reconnecting with recently. Prayer had, has had a negative connotation for me because of my religious upbringing. Now connecting more with my indigenous roots and, and these traditions, recognizing, you know, and, and what medicine has helped me to feel and truly embody and like know that it's real is this sense of spirit and universal energy that, you know, it's like they say gran, gran misterio. And so it's like the great mystery. And we're always moving in this like constant dance through life. And we have the opportunity to and we're fortunate enough to be able to engage with it in this way if we choose to. So our mindset, and I think that, you know, through offering prayer, and prayer to me can just be an intention. You know, it can be, can be me sitting there with my eyes closed and thinking about visualizing my future or speaking to my ancestors or just feeling, trying to feel my ancestors within myself. You know, there's so many different ways and healing and spirituality doesn't look one way. I know sometimes with the media and even with the current research in the psychedelic movement, we can feel that way, but it's so diverse. And it's like this beautiful network, mycelial network that really encompasses all that we are and all that we do and everything around us is alive. 
And one last thing here is breath work. Breath work for me has proved to be so instrumental in healing so many different traumas and experiences I've had in my past and currently. And so I'm launching um, a breathwork course starting in January through Philodos that is going to explore these different aspects of our consciousness in a supportive healing community. Um, and I'm really, really excited about that because not everyone has the the availability or the access to be able and go do these psychedelic medicines and do these journeys, not yet at least. And so breathwork is a really great alternative where it allows us to get into these into these similar states of altered consciousness, utilizing simply just your breath. So it's so safe and it's so accessible. Um, and so that's really, that goes hand in hand. So these are some of the things that I do to maintain my mental wellness. Great, that's so beautiful. And I'm so, well, I'm excited for the breathwork course. Thank you. Uh, yeah, like the my, something that's been like, a paramount in me like getting a grip on my anxiety has been my breath so mm -hmm. yeah i'm really excited for that and excited to see what what it's like thank you um, yeah you should totally yeah. totally come on in we have a, we're actually doing a holiday sale right now obviously for the holidays until oh, friday cool. um so 25 percent off for anyone who's interested so i'll send that link your way yeah, great. So lastly, um, as we wrap up, what are some ways that my audience and I can stay up to date with you and the work that you do? Yeah, so you can always find me on um, different social platforms. My personal Instagram is Aubrey B. Howard. Um, I also am the co-founder of Philodose, as I mentioned, which is a psychedelic organization, an agency that's focused on community building and intentional experiences around healing and psychedelic medicine. And so that's like at Philodos um, and same, same on LinkedIn. And I'm trying to think, I don't have a Twitter. I don't, I don't go on Twitter <laughs> and Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and you can find us. Um, you can find me at spiritmedicine.co co and uh, philodose.com as well. Great. Thank you so much. This was a great conversation with so much amazing information. And I think it's going to be really helpful for a lot of people. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jade. It was amazing getting to connect with you and, and just sharing about some of this work. And I'm excited to see where it all goes. There's, I think the future is really bright. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Students of Mind. I want to give a huge thank you to Aubrey for being on the show. She provided so much more information than I was expecting, which was really cool. So I'm so excited to share this episode with you all. If you're interested in following Aubrey and seeing more of her work, all of her links will be in the description of this episode. Show notes, as well as all of the resources Aubrey mentioned in this episode, can be found on the episode's website page at studentsofmind.com. As always, all links to the Students of Mind team's social media is also linked in the description of the episode. Don't forget to check out the Audible News and Podcast mobile app Newsly and use code STUDENTS for a free month of a premium plan. If you have time, please feel free to leave a rating and review for the show. You can do so by scrolling to the bottom of the podcast show page on Apple or Spotify or use an app like Podchaser. Thank you so much again for listening. I hope you learned something new or resonated with something you heard today, and I will see you next episode.